In this video, we're going to continue our story about CQRS and Mediator integration with .NET Core. In the previous video, we covered the integration part, explained the basics behind CQRS and Mediator, and also covered the query implementation. If you didn't watch that one, we strongly recommend to do that. Now, in this one, we will cover the other concepts – commands, notifications and behaviors. So, let's open the project we created in the previous video and continue our implementation with commands. To create our first command, we are going to add a request that takes a single product and updates our fake data store. So, let's navigate to our commands folder and add a new class. Let's name it add product command. Let's make it a record. We'll also provide a single product property and we want this record to inherit from the I request interface. Notice this time the I request interface doesn't have a type parameter. This is because we aren't returning a value. Take note that due to the simplicity of this example, we are using a domain product entity as the return type for our query and as a parameter for the command. In real world apps, we wouldn't do that. We would use DTOs to hide a domain entity from the public API. If you want to see how to use DTOs with web API actions, you can watch our handling GET requests and handling POST, PUT and DELETE requests videos. The links will be in the description. Now we need to handle this command. To do that, let's navigate to the HANDLERS folder and create a new class. Let's name it add product handler. Again, this handler must inherit from the I request handler interface. And we have to provide a single parameter, the add product command as our command. Now let's implement the interface. After this, we are going to do the same thing we did with our previous handler. Let's create a private read only fake date store, fake date store field implement a constructor and make it a one liner. Additionally, we have to make our method async and await the fake data store dot add product method where we provide request dot product as an argument. Finally, we'll just write a return. With this out of the way, we can visit our controller. Let's add an HTTP POST attribute first. Then we're going to create a public async task action result action named add product. It accepts a single from body parameter of the product type and let's name it product. Now, we have to use the send method again. So, let's add await sender.send and provide a new add product command instance with our product that we receive in a request. Lastly, we will return the 201 status code as a result. Now, let's start the app to test it. In our Postman, we will create another POST request with the same URI as for the previous one. We also have the headers added and the row body. Now let's send it. And we get a 201 created response. To verify this action, let's return to the previous request and send it. We can see all the products there. So everything is working great. Now, while this may seem simple in theory, 
Let's try to think beyond the fact we are simply updating an in-memory list of products. We are communicating to a data store via simple message constructs, without having any idea of how it's being implemented. The commands and queries could be pointing to different data stores. They don't know how their requests will be handled and they don't care. As you can see, our post action just returns a 201 status code. But that's not enough. There is a much better way of informing our client that this action succeeded. To do that, let's open our add product command record. And let's add a new product parameter for the iRequest interface. Then we can navigate to the handler. Add a product here for the return type. Here as well to return task product. And finally modify the return statement by calling request.product. Now we can navigate to the controller and modify our action. We'll add a new product to return variable to accept the result of the send method. And then instead of this return statement, we're going to call the created at route method and provide the get product by ID as the name of the action we are pointing to, add a new anonymous object with a single ID property, which we assign from product.id, and finally provide our product to return object as the last argument. Now let's start the app again and use our previous post request one more time. We can see the 201 result, but we can also see a newly created product in the response body. Additionally, in the headers tab, we can find the location property. Let's copy that URI and send the request. We can see the successful response. We will not implement the put or delete requests since now you should be able to do it on your own and it is good for practice. Just pay attention that usually put and delete actions don't return a value in the response body, just a 204 status code. So create your commands and handlers accordingly. In our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, we have a complete implementation alongside all the other Web API features. So if you would like to learn more, feel free to visit the books page. The link will be in the description below. Now let's continue with the mediator notifications. So we only see a single request being handled by a single handler. However, what if we want to handle a single request by multiple handlers? That's where notifications come in. In these situations, we usually have multiple independent operations that need to occur after some event. For example, sending an email or invalidating a cache. To demonstrate this, we will update the add product command flow we created previously to publish a notification and have it handled by two handlers. Of course, sending an email and invalidating a cache is out of the scope of this video. But to demonstrate the behavior of notifications, let's instead simply update our fake values list to signify that something was handled. That said, let's open our fake data store and add a new method. This will be a public async method returning task and named event occurred. Also, we will provide two parameters, the product, product and the string event. Inside the body, let's use our products list and call the single method to extract the product from that list with the ID equal to the product ID parameter and then set its name to a custom string containing the product.name value and the value of the event parameter. 
Lastly, let's await task.completed task. Now that we modified our store, let's create the notifications and handlers. To do that, let's create a new folder and name it notifications. Then create a new class and name it product added notification. Let's remove the parentheses and make it a record. Then let's add a product parameter. And finally, this record must inherit from the iNotification interface. This is the equivalent of the iRequest we saw earlier, but for notifications. To continue, let's navigate to the Handlers folder and create a new handler class. Let's name it Email Handler. This class must inherit from the iNotification handler interface where we have to provide the product added notification, the notification record that our handler is going to handle. Let's implement the interface for now. To continue, we're going to add a private read only fake date store fake date store variable and implement our constructor the same as before. Now, let's make the method async and implement it with the await fake date store dot event occurred method and pass the notification dot product as the first argument and the custom email sent string as the second one. Also, we will await task dot completed task. Next, let's navigate to the handlers folder again and create one more handler class named cache invalidation handler. Here we will have almost the same implementation as with the previous handler. So let's inherit from the required interface, provide the needed parameter and also implement an interface. Next, we need our private read only fake date store field and a constructor. Finally, we can copy the implementation from the email handler class, paste it here, modify the string argument to cache invalidated, and make this method async. That's all. To test this, let's navigate to the controller and modify the post action. But before we do the action modification, we have to use the iPublisher interface to publish our notifications. So let's add another private read-only iPublisher publisher field. Add a second publisher parameter in the constructor, cut this piece, paste it into the body and initialize the publisher field. Now we can move on to the post action modification. Between these two lines we will add a weight publisher.publish and pass a new product added notification with the product to return as an argument. If you wanted to, you could have done this directly in the handler for add product command, but let's leave it here for simplicity. Now we can start our app. In Postman, let's first send the GET request and we have our result. Next, let's run the POST request. And now, when we send the GET request again, you can see that the name is not just test product 4, but it has additions from both notifications. Now, of course, this is a simple example, but the key takeaway here is that we can fire an event and have it handled many times without the producer knowing any different. 
with the notifications implemented, in the final section, we'll talk about something called behaviors in Mediator. Often, when we build applications, we have many cross-cutting concerns. These include authorization, validating, and logging. Instead of repeating this logic throughout our handlers, we can make use of behaviors. Behaviors are very similar to ASP.NET Core middleware, in that they accept a request, perform some action, and then optionally pass along the request. So let's see how to implement it. First, let's create another folder and name it Behaviors. Also, we'll add a new class here and name it Logging Behavior. We have to extend our class with two generic parameters, tRequest and tResponse. And then it has to inherit from the iPipeline behavior interface with the same tRequest and tResponse parameters. Also, we need to add constraint with the where tRequest inherits from iRequest tResponse. Now let's implement this interface. Next, we are going to add the logger in this class. To do that, let's add a private read-only iLogger, add the logging behavior tRequest tResponse as a parameter, and name it logger. Then we can create our constructor. After the constructor is ready, let's make our method async. Then, with the help of the logger field, we will log information and provide a custom string handling type of tRequest.name. Then, let's create a response by awaiting the next delegate. Again, we will use the logger to log information with the custom string handled type of tResponse.name. And finally, return a response. Now, to use this behavior class, we have to register it in the program class. Here, we'll call builder.services.addSingleton method and as a first parameter, we'll provide type of iPipeline behavior. And as a second parameter, we'll add type of logging behavior. Notice that we are using this notation to specify that the behavior can be used for any generic type parameters. Now to test this, let's run our application and run the get all products request. At this point, if we inspect the command window, we can see some interesting messages. This is the logging output before and after our get products query handler was invoked. The important thing here is we didn't need to modify our existing requests or handlers. We simply added a new behavior and wired it up. So that's it. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you like the video and want to support us. You can also use that bell button to get notifications from our channel. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again in another video. Until then, all the best.